Welcome, everyone. I'm Paula Fever, the Zojo Developer Evangelist. And our topic this time is the observer design pattern. So first of all, what are design patterns? Well, I'll go with the, uh, the definition here from Wikipedia. And it's a general reusable solution to a common problem related to software design, of course. So there's a lot of design patterns. Um, and there's, this is one we're going to talk about, but uh, that's just a high level. The important thing to understand about design patterns is that they're concepts, they're not specific implementations. So when someone talks about a design pattern, it doesn't mean it's a specific uh, algorithm per se. Uh, there's often a variety of ways you can implement a design pattern. Uh, it's just a technique that uh, you can use that uh, you know is going to work, that is uh, understandable. So it's it's uh, it's a concept more than anything. And these have been around for a while. Uh, I think I think when I was uh, doing a little research, the topic first came up probably in the late seventies. But the book Design Patterns in nineteen ninety four is probably where these things started to get more prominence and became talked about more often. And the observer pattern is an a behavioral pattern in that book, Design Patterns. And that book has a lot of them, uh, 20 or 30. So what is the observer pattern? Well, this pattern is when an object that is called the subject maintains a list of its dependents called observers and notifies them automatically when something changes. So you can think of it as a publish subscribe pattern. Something tells something else, hey, I want you to notify me when you have changes. And it is surprisingly useful to have a technique like this. You know, if you've ever run into apps where you've uh, used them and you've made a change to something and you're still using the app and you notice the old value is still displayed somewhere. Uh, that could be a good situation for an observer pattern to have notified that part of the app that something changed. Uh, one technique is for preferences, for example. Uh, if you're using your app, odds are you're going to have things open, things in the middle of being used. And if the user goes in and changes a preference, well, that could change how the app behaves or looks or displays things. And you would want to have some way to notify the parts of the app where that's relevant, that, hey, something changed and you should update yourself accordingly. So uh, preferences can be a great way to do that. Um, display names, another one I thought of, um, you know, often you have displays of information, names or whatnot that are throughout the app. And if they're, no, if they're displayed in more than one place and something causes that to change, it's good to notify all the places so that they can update it. So what we're going to look at today is a Zojo implementation of the observer pattern. And this is actually going to show you how you might do some preferences. And what I'm going to have is a window that is going to be an observer and it will get notified of preference changes. And the preference is going to be the subject and it will notify all the observers when uh, when something changes. And then that will tell the window, here's the new preferences, update yourself as you deem fit. And to do this, we're going to make use of interfaces. Let's jump right in. All right, so here I have a Zojo project and we'll just go through the different parts. This is not really a super complicated thing, so actually this should get through this pretty quickly. Um, but the idea is to get the general understanding and then you can think about how you might apply this technique in your own apps. So the first thing to note is the two interfaces that are here. I have a subject interface and an observer interface. So the observer interface, I wanna show that one first. Now, of course, interfaces only have methods on them and they don't have code or anything. And the observer interface is the windows, if you'll recall. And you can see just gonna have one method on it. So this means anything that is an observer 
has to have this method on it, has to implement this method. This method has a parameter where the preferences will be passed in so that it can read them and do what it needs to do. But this method will need to be implemented on anything that uses this interface. Now there's no code, and then that's intentional because it's an interface, but also because each window could possibly be working differently. It could have different things it wants to update, different controls or who knows what. So it's not like there's gonna be one set of code that's going to work for everything. This just means that you have the specific method on there and it will be known about so that it can be called. The subject is the thing that kind of contains the information and it is gonna be responsible for notifying the observers. So this has three methods on it. And we've got the notify method. We've got the register observer method here. And this is what uh, something that wants to be an observer will call to essentially tell uh, the subject, hey, uh, I want to be notified when things change. And then there's also the remove so that you can say, hey, I no longer care about being notified. So you don't need to, to bother me. So these are the things that need to be implemented on the subject. Now, technically in this rather lightweight example, I didn't really need this subject interface because I only have a single thing that's using it. But it's good to have a generic uh, interface here in case you did build uh, multiple uh, classes in your project that were going to be observer, use this pattern anyway. So those are the two interfaces just for the setup. And let's take a look at preferences. This is the preferences class. And you can see here, if I click on interfaces, you can see that it has the subject interface selected, which means I have to implement the three methods here. So if I look at register first, this is just adding the observer that uh, called this method to an array. And there's just a property here the observer's array. We just you know, keep track of them there, nothing too fancy. And then when uh, an observer asks to be removed, just go through, find it in the array and remove it. And then when it's time to notify, just loop through the array and we call the update method. Now, if you look at the array, you can see the type is observer interface. The type isn't window. And uh, that means we could have lots of things that aren't necessarily windows that could be um, observing. Uh, it could be a specific control, I suppose, if you wanted. But it doesn't, uh, so it's not based on a class, it's based on the, in the interface. So this is able to iterate through all the items there and call the update method because that is part of the interface. And then it's passing in the preferences itself so that uh, the observer has access to those preferences and can read them in and, and make the changes it needs to. All right, so that is the preferences. We got the two interfaces. So that the preferences uses the subject interface. Observer interface is used by the things that are observers. In this case, that would be the window. So here I have just a, a window with a big text area on it. And you can see here, it implements the observer interface. And the window has couple pieces of notable code. The first thing is that when the window opens, it's going to register itself with the, uh, uh, the subject essentially and say, hey, I am something that wants to be notified of changes. And then when the window closes, tells the subject, hey, you can remove me, I don't care about changes anymore. And then the other thing that is, this is the method that's part of the observer interface that needs to be implemented. This is the update method. It's passed in the parameters. And here is the code that uses those uh, preferences to update itself as appropriate. So in this case, this is going to change the background color of the text area, possibly tweak the text color to make it more visible, depending on what the background color is, and then also change uh, the text font. And again, you can have any code you want here that is um, 
applicable for how the, the window works in this particular case. Uh, but the important thing is that the window was notified, something in the preference changes, here are the preferences values, update yourself accordingly. Uh, next we have the actual preferences window. And this just has the settings for the two different uh, preferences that we care about that we've set up background color and font. And I should point out that I have set up the uh, uh, global instance of the preferences here on the app. That's just uh, instantiated when the app starts. And that's what the preferences window uh, uses to set the preference value. So if you look at the uh, controls here, each of the controls, whenever something gets modified, so if you check one of the radio buttons, uh, it changes the background color preference value appropriately and then calls the notify observers method, which here on the window is just calling the notify observers method on the preferences class itself. And if you'll recall, that is the one that loops through everything and calls the update method. And that's pretty much the extent of the code. Uh, in this example. So let's run this so you can see what it looks like. So I got one window. Let's open up a few windows, spread them out. And then open up the preferences window. So you can see I can check any of the preferences here. And as soon as I do that, all the windows are notified and they're updating themselves accordingly. Fast and easy. Way better than having the windows attempt to do this manually by checking the current state of the preferences at periodic times. Uh, way better than having the preferences have to know about specific windows or even, you know, try to scan which windows are open and call public methods on them and stuff like that. Uh, just a, a much simpler design that can be uh, used in lots of lots of different places. And I don't think there's anything else I wanted to point out here in the project. That's pretty much the extent of it. Like I said, it's not a super complicated project. All right, so let's uh, go over a couple of resources that will help you out. Uh, first of all, zojo.com slash download is where you get the latest version of Zojo. And I do encourage people to subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash go Zojo. You'll be notified when new videos are posted, including these videos when they get uploaded to YouTube, in case you want to watch them again later our free book introduction to programming with Zojo is available at zojo.com slash learn. And our user community forum.zojo.com. Great place to ask questions, search for answers, all kinds of stuff. And for specifics about uh, patterns and observer, you can uh, always check the docs for information about Zojo, of course, but there are a few examples that are available. Uh, included with Zojo in the design patterns folder is an example of the observer pattern, a little different than the one I showed here today, uh, mainly just in, you know, what it's doing. I think it's changing the background color of the entire window and might be implemented slightly differently. Uh, this example probably will show up in that folder in an upcoming release. And there's also some blog posts I wanted to point out. You can always just, of course, search, you know, the Zojo blog for uh, design patterns, but there is a couple uh, design patterns on Observer, part one and two, that go into some significant detail. And then the older one, actually, on the older real software blog on the Observer pattern. And always brought up to me are the two books that if you want to dive into this in more detail that are worth checking out. The original book, of course, Design Patterns from 1994. And then 
lots of people tell me they really like head first design patterns, which came out in 2004. Uh, and like I said, the, you know, these techniques are all pretty they're concepts. The books will obviously show some uh, ways to implement them, um, but uh, they can be implemented in any language. So it doesn't really matter. And speaking of heading to zojo.com slash download to grab the latest version of Zojo, 2018 release three shipped today. And it had over 120 changes and improvements. And I just want to briefly highlight a couple for you. Uh, one of the big ones is Mac OS Mojave dark mode support is now available in the Zojo IDE and your own apps. Super easy to turn on in your apps. You just flick a switch in the shared build settings that says you support dark mode and your app will work in dark mode. You may have to tweak some of your graphics or drawing code to uh, maybe tweak some colors and stuff like that, but uh, controls and everything else will just switch for you automatically. We continue to add Windows improvements. Uh, Windows now uses a native label control. This provides much better performance. And we've also tweaked text rendering uh, in the drawing code so that that is much more accurate. Another big change is incremental compilation for 64-bit and ARM. And this allows you to have much faster debug builds. And this is critical for those of you that are working in 64-bit because you uh, want to be able to run and debug quickly, right? So definitely check that out for that speed improvement. And 2018 release three now works with Xcode 10 and the iOS 12 simulator for your iOS projects. And we continue to update SQLite and it is now up to version 3.24. And there are a couple big versions of SQLite after that that uh, we're investigating for a future release. They added uh, some more powerful things. I think uh, their alter table might've been enhanced, but uh, some of those coming down the pike look interesting. And there's also a new documentation wiki. So if you go to docs.zojo.com, you'll find that it looks pretty different and it has all the language reference content. So that includes everything in the Zojo framework, all the iOS stuff, and then all the desktop and web stuff and everything else all in one place. And that will eventually be the home for everything. Right now, the uh, user guides and that material still exists at developer.zojo.com but that will be moved over here in the coming months. All right, if you have questions on observer patterns in general or anything Zojo related, or even anything baseball related with the World Series starting tonight, you can reach me via email, paul at zojo.com or on Twitter, at Lefevre or at Zojo. I want to thank everyone for attending. Have a great day.